Thanks for coming to this panel. It is a beautiful day out, and uh, you guys could be out there having a spritz, but instead you're with us learning about spreadsheets, so that's kind of cool. Um, I'm here with Leon Yin and Gabriel Geiger. Uh, we're gonna be talking about finding data to investigate algorithms. Um, I'm gonna give it a second before, so our slides show up. Oh, yeah. and, Yeah, so I think the run of show here is that each of us are gonna present for maybe uh, 10 minutes or so about some work that we've done and um, hopefully leave ample time for questions to just talk about whatever it is you guys wanna talk about. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, here's Leon. Yeah, and I'll say that um, our slides are available. We made that link and if you take a photo of that, uh, I forget, QR code, you can download it and look at it. We're gonna have some links in there so um, you might wanna go back to it. So. Um, hi, my name is Leon Yin. I'm an investigative data reporter at The Markup. I'm going to be talking about an investigation I conducted with Aaron Sankin, who's in the crowd, looking at internet speeds across the United States. So I'm going to be talking about um, a web scraping technique called finding an undocumented API, and I'm going to talk a bit about the public data sources that we use and how it came all together for this investigation. So um, before I get into the nitty gritty, I wanted to give you an insight into the findings. So we found that four internet service providers called ISPs charge the same price for drastically different speeds based on where you live. We collected over one million internet plans across the country in major cities and we found some extremely stark patterns. Historically redlined areas, lower income areas, and the neighborhoods with the highest concentration of people or color were disproportionately asked to pay, overpay for slow speeds. Um, and so this is, this is how we did it. So we originally sought to reproduce an academic study by three researchers from Princeton University. And what they did is they went to the websites of major ISPs and inputted millions of addresses to uh, collect the availability, speeds, and prices of internet plans. And they used that data to show that ISPs vastly overstated the availability, speed, and price uh, um, to, of competition uh, 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 to the FCC, which is the Federal Communications Committee in the United States. Uh, I was originally tasked with simply reproducing it. Uh, and to do that, I do what I often do. I do a trial analysis, right? Like, what's the minimal viable analysis to prove that we have a story? Is it worth pursuing, right? Because these investigations can take quite a while. And so what I did is I created one web scraper for AT&T and looked in one city, uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. And here is what the data looks like plotted. So in red is no services available, and green is fast fiber service. So immediately we found patterns here, right? They're little pockets where fiber is available, and there are areas where internet is slow or non-available. Non <clears throat> When we merged census data from the American Community Survey, we immediately found patterns that were suggestive of disparate outcomes. So um, this is the percentage of addresses per uh, income group that were given different buckets of speed. So for red, um, you'll see that low income are disproportionately no service and slow service, and they have the smallest share of fast speeds. What was most uh, surprising about this is regardless of what color, you know, what speed you're given, the plan was the same price, $55, right? And so we wanted to know where else this was happening and who else was responsible for this pricing scheme. So what we did is we did some research and found that a uh, advocacy group called NDIA had found that this had occurred previously from AT&T and Verizon, and they coined this term tier flattening to describe the pricing strategy of charging the same price for different speeds. So we found that in addition to AT&T and Verizon, that CenturyLink and EarthLink also practice this uh, tier flattening service. They serve essentially the entirety of the continental United States, right? And so as you can imagine, the scale and ambition of this investigation was changing rapidly. And so we do uh, the next thing, which is we revisit the hypothesis, right? So what did we want to test? Um, so originally, our story was more of a policy-based story about what is being told to the FCC. But when we looked at price, we realized that it's a consumer's story, right? So who's overpaying or asked to overpay for slow speeds? So we want to see if there are patterns in the areas in the social groups who are given the worst deals as defined as slow speeds for the same price as faster speeds. So this, the secondary hypothesis was like, how can we actually measure the digital divide 
right? It's a term that's common. ISPs and everyone kind of accept that it's a thing. But there's no accountability, right? Who is contributing to the digital divide? What does it look like? Where is it happening? And so with this data, we hope to answer such questions. But there are challenges that we found from the trial analysis, which is, again, a great diagnostic of kind of the problems you'll hit. So some of the problems we had were that web scraping was extremely slow. Here you'll see that I have about 12 different automated web browsers all going to AT&T, each putting a different address in and trying to get the plan. And it was so slow. It took me like two weeks to get about 1,000 or so addresses for that trial. And it occurred because you know, browser automation is clunky and slow. And our IP addresses, the actual computers, were getting blocked because um, these websites purposely throttle that information. Additionally, we had other considerations that we didn't know, like where would we get addresses? Um, Stanford, uh, sorry, Princeton had used a data set that was incomplete. We didn't know what we'd do to get you know, most of the continental United States. And then there's the matter of categorization, which is another common problem you'll face with these kinds of investigations, right? And seldom is the thing that you want to measure already encoded in a column. You have to do some research and reporting to figure out exactly what you're going to measure. And so let's talk about how we uh, approach some of these problems. So the first is where do you find addresses, right? So we chose kind of the simple kind of big data approach of let's just do the biggest city in each state. Uh, and that allowed us to focus on urban areas, which are often neglected in conversations about the digital divide, which tend to be be between rural uh, areas. So what we did is we found some open sources. The first is open addresses, and the second is the NYC open data. Uh, and that helped us get about 12 million addresses for each of the cities. But that data was largely incomplete, as you can imagine, with open sources. They're kind of dirty. They're missing things like just the city, right? And so we were able to fix that by sending each of these addresses through the census geocoder, which includes things like the incorporated city and the census block group, which is absolutely essential for our, us to you know, add socioeconomic questions. And that helped us get to our goal of collecting kind of a collective representative sample of each of these cities. So we got about a 10% sample of addresses for each census block group in each of these uh, 45 cities. And then we're like, well, how do we scrape this data? Because it was so slow with the trial. Um, I was wondering, you know, this doesn't seem feasible. Like, we would be here for decades. Um, so we found this thing, um, which is a technique I use often, called finding an undocumented API. And so if you don't know what an API is, it's kind of like, uh, how you communicate with a server, right? Like when you're on a website, there's stuff happening behind the scenes that'll query data and bring it back. And there's a way to find that data and use it in reporting. Um, and so we built a scraper for each of the different four ISPs. They all kind of do these simple sequential requests all through an undocumented API. The first is an auto-completion of an address uh, and verifying that it's an address that's recognized by the provider. And then, if it's a multi-unit building, it's choosing an apartment number. Then lastly and finally, it's checking the availability and listing the plans. And it's only possible because we're able to keep track of the context, like you need cookies and such, in between these requests, or the computer is too dumb to know what you're actually asking for. We're also able to make this super duper fast because uh, we use something called asynchronicity, meaning that we could have many parallel processes happening at once, and they don't, they're not dependent on one another. Um, which is kind of a computer science thing. I won't go into that. And we're able to do that because we routed each of these requests through a proxy IP, meaning through other people's computers, our requests were being distributed. And it's something you have to do and something that Princeton researchers had to do to do the same task. And so um, it's a necessary task to do uh, when you have to. So now we have the data and we started thinking about categorization. And so to do that, we used benchmarks that were established from other organizations. We weren't using our own assumptions. Um, and so one of the clearest ones was the FCC's current definition of broadband internet, which is at or above 25 megabits per second. So if it didn't meet that threshold, we consider it slow. And that's the main variable that we look at. We try to think, uh, determine if things are slow or not, speeds. And then, you know, uh, a nonprofit that we talk to a lot, or sorry, an FCC organization was Common Sense Media which you need greater than 200 megabits per second to support uh, remote work and remote education for uh, households of about four residents. And so we use these benchmarks to kind of categorize our speeds, and then we got our socioeconomic data, mostly from the ACS, and we binned it specifically into quartiles, which is like you sort it by, let's say, median household income, and then there's like the bottom fourth and the top fourth and the middle two fourths. And the top and the bottom became our most, uh, the social <clears throat> demographics we mostly looked at of lower income, upper income. We did the same thing based on the non-Hispanic white 
population of each block group too to make the least white and most white groups. And we did that because each city has a unique kind of relativity when it comes to these socioeconomics, and this made sense at the time. And then lastly, which is really cool, this data set you might not know about, is uh, mapping inequality by University of Richmond. They digitized hundreds of historical redlining maps in GeoJSON, and you can merge that data right in. And we considered things that were hazardous or D to be redlined, and we compared that to things that were A and B, which are best and still desirable. Um, and so we really are looking at the extremes here, right? Lower income, upper income, least adverse, most diverse, redlined and non-redlined, essentially. <clears throat> A really important thing about this categorization system is that someone could just say, well, you're cherry picking, right? You're doing a categorization scheme uh, to essentially show results in certain ways. So it's really important to account for different possibilities, right? And so we looked at different methods of categorization and our results are pretty much exactly the same, which I think is a really important step of bulletproofing, right? About hypothesis-driven journalism, you're trying to disprove yourself, right? It's actually kind of easy to prove a pattern, especially if it's as dark as this, but it's really important to, uh, to just make sure that you check yourself. Um, so yeah, doing that, it allowed us to get, see for each city and each provider the proportion of addresses, sorry for the hard P, the proportion of addresses of uh, households that were given slow speeds, right? And so for Minneapolis, for example, you can see that over half of the households in lower income areas were offered slow speeds by CenturyLink for $50, and only 8% uh, in, uh, of upper income areas. And so we did this for each city, each provider, and each socioeconomic feature. Um, and this helped us really measure the digital divide and prove that how widespread it is. And again, um, if you want to look at the results, all 22, 100% of the cities with historical redlining maps had disparities based on those ratings. 92% of cities had disparities based on income, and two-thirds uh, two had disparities based on race and ethnicity. Um, I seldom see patterns that stark, but uh, it was a little bit unbelievable. Uh, and so we made this data available for localization. So we wrote up a guide that has um, basically organized each city's data uh, and also interactive maps and tips for reporting. And we released this uh, with publication and we got some excellent pickup by nine different local news outlets, including Sarah Alvarez at Outlier Media, who's in the crowd. Hi, Sarah. Um, and um, you can check this out uh, yourself. And lastly, I'll leave you with some tips of uh, a tutorial to how to find undocumented APIs that go through case studies, including this, and also a tool we built with Big Local News. Cheryl is also in the audience, which we use to uh, simplify this process of uh, getting random street addresses. Uh, hey everyone, my name is Gabriel Geiger and I'm an investigative reporter at Lighthouse Reports, which is a nonprofit newsroom based in the Netherlands. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, essentially asking agencies for the data that you want or need. Um, and the case study I'm going to use is uh, an article we published with Wired, with Dhruv, um, in March called Inside the Suspicion Machine where we obtained uh, an algorithm used in the Dutch city of Rotterdam to assess who is at most risk of committing welfare fraud. And we um, ran an experiment on, on this algorithm and uh, proved that it discriminated against uh, women, people with an uh, ethnic background, parents, young people. Um, and I think like to the sort of theme of this panel, um, before people had any access to this algorithm, officials were claiming that it's uh, unbiased and um, you know fair. So this is this purple thing is from uh, an Accenture slide which developed um, the the algorithm and um, you know for us as data journalists it was amazing because we had a big bold claim in in um, big font. Uh, so you know advanced analytics, machine learning equals unbiased citizen outcomes. Um, and then we also had Rotterdam officials themselves saying there's no bias in this thing. Um, but there was no way to scrutinize that. So we tried for um, a year and a half to obtain access to this algorithm using uh, European transparency laws. Um, and, and finally, after that year and a half, um, the city handed over this algorithm so we could run this experiment. Um, and we essentially looked to test that claim. Which groups are receiving higher scores? Um, is there disparities? We had our experiment reviewed by academics and then, you know, inspired very much by the markup, uh, we published our methodology and materials online so people could reproduce what we did. 
And here you can see on, on the right the sort of top line findings, right? Um, you know, not knowing Dutch well, a proxy for ethnicity increases your chance of being investigated. Being a woman increases your chance of being investigated, being a parent. And then if you, of course, fall, fall into multiple of those categories, um, your, your risk is, is um, compounded. And, you know, this is high, high stakes because the people who, who are assigned high risk scores are automatically flagged for incredibly punitive welfare fraud investigations where their lives are turned over. So what we actually needed to do this experiment, we needed this machine learning algorithm itself, so essentially the file that you could give data and then get an output risk score. We needed the source code that was um, that essentially trained it. Um, we needed the training data, so this algorithm was trained on the personal data past fraud um, investigations. And we needed um, technical documentation from Rotterdam. Um, and all of those things, besides the training data, we got through um, freedom of information laws. Um, and we've done this work all over Europe, and some of that's coming out in the coming uh, months. So we have now sent more than 100 FOIAs across eight different European countries. Um, uh, and, you know, with sort of piecemeal responses, so we've had to learn a lot about the different sort of uh, restrictions in Europe um, and, and how to overcome um, challenges, which are, um, I think, there's sort of three themes that, that we see. Um, the first is this freedom of information asymmetry. So um, you might not know what the data you're asking for actually looks like. Um, and that makes it really easy for agencies to essentially um, disregard your request on procedural grounds, like you're not being specific enough, or they can make uh, invoke some FOIA except sorry from transparency exception, um, and you can't argue against it easily because you don't know what the data looks like, and you don't know if there's any any sort of grounds to to their arguments. Um, in Europe, we also have, of course, uh, data protection law, which means that uh, getting access to any sort of individual level data is incredibly difficult. Um, and for some types of reporting, you need that individual level data. Um, and then the, the third one is one we're all familiar with, or you know, anybody who, who does FOIA is familiar with, which is that agencies just don't want to give you any data um, and will fight tooth and nail not to do that most of the time. Um, so a few concrete tips that I had for overcoming some of these. Um, the first is uh, a lot of these databases that you want to get data from have this uh, like sort of standard document called a data dictionary, which describes all the columns in the database and the variables, um, what they're called. Um, and what that allows you to do um, is then be more specific about what from the database you actually want and what it looks like. Also, a lot of these agencies have handbooks for their data scientists that you can FOIA. Um, so I definitely recommend uh, doing that because it will have a lot of information there about the data that you may be able to get. And the third one, which, which came uh, quite in handy for another investigation we did about um, a database used by Frontex, which is the European um, Border Control Agency, is the PowerPoints that they give to the new like caseworkers who are actually going to be like putting data into the into the database. So they had like screenshots of screenshots of it in this PowerPoint and like um, and and you know like different column names and stuff. And that allowed us to FOIA for specific columns that we knew they wouldn't have any grounds to refuse us. Um, so for the data protection point. Um, there's a few options that we've uh, explored and one that we're trying now. The first is to, you can essentially pitch the agency like, okay, let me go into like your basement with like no Wi-Fi connection on an air-gapped computer and you can essentially run your analysis um, and then only take away the aggregate results and you're gonna be in compliance with European data protection law. So there's like exemptions around research. Um, the second thing is there's a lot of times like top level analyses of this data that agencies do. So in the case of Rotterdam, we asked for uh, these analyses and they sent us back the, the distribution um, of, of each of these variables in the training data. So this is like age on the right side of the screen. Um, there was the added benefit that within those like graphs and distributions was all the real training data. So like data that they accidentally leaked us. Um, uh, in these plotly graphs, so you may want to ask agencies for plotly graphs or whatever data that you're trying to get. Um, and the last thing which we're doing now with one agency who's cooperating with us is asking for synthetic data. So um, depending on the type of reporting you're doing, you can um, 
yeah, it, it might not work all the time or, or not be right for you, but um, there's like these machine learning models that take, you know, real personal data and then essentially um, create fake data, fake people, but that maintains all the same sort of characteristics of, of the real data, so like correlations and this type of stuff. Um, so f especially for algorithmic accountability reporting, that can be useful um, because you can still sort of figure out whether there was errors in training data, in synthetic training data, because it maintains all the same relationships. Um, lastly, uh, overcoming some of the unwilling agencies. Um, so of course you have like legal remedies. You can actually go and like sue um, these agencies, if they're not cooperating, you can appeal depending on which, which European country you're in. But there's a few other options that we've tried. Um, the first one that we've done is um, parliamentary questions. So most European countries have a mechanism where uh, legislators can ask the government for data um, or like statistics and the government is legally obliged to answer them. Um, so what we've done in Germany is ask someone, uh, like essentially a legislator who was like sympathetic for what we were trying to do, to ask the government for data that they wouldn't give us. Um, the second thing in Europe, which I think people need to make more use of, is um, subject access requests. So under European data protection law, individuals have the right to see what data agencies hold about them and the right to understand how that data is used in automated decision-making systems. Um, so for example, in the UK, um, like the worker, worker Info Exchange has done some really cool stuff with getting gig workers, like large amounts of gig workers, to send in requests um, to understand more about like Uber's black box algorithms. Um, and the last one is to uh, do what Dhruv and Leon are telling you to do, because that requires no interaction with any of these agencies and the like litany of bullshit excuses I've gotten. So. Yeah, at that note, I'll uh, hand it over to, uh, oh right, and be annoying, <laughs> keep, keep trying, don't give up. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk a bit about uh, different strategies I've used to investigate uh, black box technology and algorithms and go through some examples of stories. Um, first of all, you know, my name is Dhruv. Uh, I am a investigative data reporter at Wired. Uh, you can email me any questions or find me on Twitter as long as Twitter is a thing. Um, rest in peace. So, yeah, I guess more often than not, um, when you're looking into technology, there isn't necessarily like an obvious route to ha uh, for getting the data that you need to investigate a hypothesis that you might have, right? Um, because it's proprietary software, um, you know, FOIA isn't necessarily always an option. Um, so you have to get kind of clever about how you find, collect, and present data. So I'm gonna take you to, through three strategies here and show you some stories that kind of illustrate that. Um, the first is crowdsourcing data. I think you all might be familiar with how this works, but in general, right, it's difficult to make claims about any algorithm without a ton of evidence. and often, right, the, the output of an algorithm presents itself to everyone a bit differently, right? Like if you think about targeted ads or pricing algorithms, um, not everyone is seeing the same thing. Um, but because these platforms are, of course, used by sometimes millions of people, um, you can leverage your readers uh, or, or as sources, right, and get their support to gain access to data that uh, you any individual alone couldn't. So. The first example I have here is uh, a story I did with Jalopnik, a uh, publication that's under good, uh, the Geo Media. Um, I worked on a story about how Uber and Lyft take far higher cuts of their drivers' earnings than they publicly say. Uh, we basically wanted to test the claim that at the time they took an average, they say they took an average of around 12% of each fee uh, the driver collected from a passenger. So what we did was uh, we crowdsourced receipts from Uber and Lyft drivers. Uh, we built a form that we hosted on jalopnik.com, uh, and then we essentially sent that around to um, rideshare driver uh, forums and things like that. And we ended up getting 10,000 receipts from drivers. Uh, and of course, this is, no, this is definitely not a representative sample of all rides from Uber and Lyft but it was enough to get us started to test a claim um, 
And what we ended up finding is that you know, they were taking way more than 12%. In fact, in, all, in a lot of cases, they were taking north of 50% of certain receipts from, from, from drivers. Uh, a similar example uh, is a crowdsourcing project I had done with Kotaku, uh, video games publication. Uh, here we asked our readers and sources to send in requests for GDPR, or for requests for their personal data using GDPR or CCPA uh, in California. And the result is that, uh, you know, we found out that Pokemon Go was collecting really, really detailed information, uh, location information about everyone who was using the game. Uh, this is like, for example, we plotted all the data. This is from one user who gave us, who gave me consent to actually use this in this presentation. But, um, you know, you could see essentially his path to work. Uh, and we found that b basically Pokemon Go was collecting uh, location data at least once a minute from, from uh, players of the game, whether or not they had the app on or off. Um, the next strategy uh, I've used is basically like alternative or clever ways uh, to collect data or to run experiments about technology. Um, I couldn't really think of a better title for this. But this kind of strategy often involves um, scraping or digging through the code of an app to find maybe a flaw or looking for uh, or building a tool to collect data. Um, the best example I have of this is a story I had done. It's actually my first story in journalism. Um, I had worked with a reporter named Kashmir Hill who wanted to try to block uh, the big five tech giants, Amazon, Facebook, Google, Microsoft and Apple from getting her attention, time, and money. And the way we did this is to, essentially, we, I built a blockade for her. Um, I built a virtual private network that the reporter then connected all of her devices to. You know, that's her phone, her smart coffee pot, her fridge, her uh, computers, you know, it, you name it, we, we connected to it. Uh, and by doing this, I was able to monitor all of her network traffic and build these firewall rules that would block any traffic to Amazon, you know, all, all the tech giants. Um, and what we found is that, like, uh, everything is broken. <laughs> everything is broken if you kind of try to immediately shut out the tech giants. Uh, I think the best example is that she couldn't make coffee in the morning because her uh, coffee maker needed to, like, check in with Amazon before uh, it, it, you know, heated up to a certain temperature or something like that. Um, and I think this is an interesting example because uh, it's not like how, how you might think about traditional data reporting. In, in this instance, we sort of built an experience for cash to see what the world would be like without these tech giants. Um, and of course, we did all the data collection and did you know, the, uh, the graphs and counted how many packets went to what, what, you know, what, what tech giant. But I think the crucial thing we did here was actually like this we showed what it would be like to live without these giants to prove that, you know, these things are embedded in our everyday systems. Uh, another example of a experiment, kind of strange experiment here, is um, uh, at Gizmodo, I worked with another reporter to enumerate hundreds of thousands of Ring cameras in the United States. Uh, Ring, if you're not familiar with it, is a doorbell surveillance company that's owned by Amazon. Uh, our hypothesis with this story was basically there are so many ring cameras facing outwards towards the street in many cities that, you know, it's probably impossible to walk down a block without being captured on, on video. So to enumerate the cameras, we scraped Ring's social networking site called Neighbors. Uh, we basically found that when we looked at the network requests uh, going, it, going to Neighbors that within each post, Ring had embedded the latitude and longitudes of the cameras themselves. So we basically just scraped, um, we scraped a couple dozen cities. Um, this is a, a map of, of course, the entire United States. But we ended up with, um, you know, a couple hundred thousand cameras. And when you zoom in, right, this is what um, a neighborhood looks like. This is a neighborhood in Chicago. Um, and I think, uh, what we really found here is like there are instances, and, and we tried to kind of measure this the best we could, but there are definitely instances where you know if, if sources in the area were you know going to walk to school or going to walk you know walk their kids to school and walk them to a playground, they would pass like 15 cameras. Um, and the last example I want to get to is my favorite one because 
Um, it's basically just when companies mess up and just leave their data lying around. And this happens more often than you'd think, um, where basically a co company's proprietary data is just indexed by Google or left completely open uh, on the internet for some, for some reason. Um, the most spectacular time a company really like stepped in it for my benefit <laughs> was this uh, was the basis for this investigation I had done with the markup about uh, predict uh, a specific predict predictive policing algorithm. If you're not familiar with the concept of predictive policing, uh, it's sort of what it sounds like. It's um, the idea that law enforcement can use historical crime data to predict the locations of future crimes. Uh, and, and they do this in, or, in order to basically like proactively send officer to patrol hotspots. Uh, critics have, of course, argued for a long time that this software disproportionately affects minority communities and results in you know, um, additional police stops, searches, arrests, and uses of force. So for this story, uh, I found uh, the leading predictive policing firm's data, essentially, in a unsecured Amazon S3 bucket. Uh, it basically was millions and millions and millions of predictions just lying around on the internet, uh, it kind of just there for anyone to stumble upon if they knew where to look. Um, and you know, I just happened to be the guy that stumbled, stumbled on it. Uh, but with the story, we were able to prove that in the majority of jurisdictions that we looked at, the most black and Latino neighborhoods were uh, targeted sometimes relentlessly by the software for additional patrols by the police. Um, and, you know, because this, story, this presentation is mostly about how you find this type of data, I'm, I'm going to kind of skip the, the findings of that story, but you all can definitely go read it. Um, but, you know, I essentially found the data through a fancy Google search. Um, there's this tool I really love that Google offers called the uh, Custom Search Engines. Uh, and what you can do with it is basically Tell, like, provide Google with a list of websites you want it to search, so that way you can only target your searches to those websites, right? So in this case, I uploaded to Google a list of uh, 3,500 police websites. And honestly, all I did was type in Predpol, the name of the company, and the first thing that showed up was uh, a website from the LAPD that linked to this. Uh, and this was the sort of foundation, I guess you guys can read that. It's like the basis of the story were these crime reports that Predpol was spitting out for each of its law enforcement clients. And this is essentially like, uh, on any given patrol, these are the hot spots that a police officer should spend some time in during their checks. So what I noticed when I saw this page is that the URL was pointing to this uh, Amazon S3 bucket. It wasn't on the LAPD's website, it was... Uh, a weird URL <laughs> that linked to uh, Amazon S3. And if you can't read that, it's you know, ppadmin.s3.com uh, or something like that. Um, it's not live anymore. <laughs> but um, when I went to that actual URL, what I found was like um, hundreds of thousands of those crime reports. Uh, so basically, through that link, I was able to enumerate you know, 7 million crime predictions for 38 different departments, and that was the basis of that particular analysis. Um, and my, I have some tips here for like, helpful things that I turn to, right? Uh, the first one is there's a, there are search engines for these unsecured S3 buckets. Um, it's called grayhatwarfare.com. You have to be careful with what you find there, but oftentimes you can, you know, I found a few different stories there over the last couple of years where, you know, the most recent one is uh, there was an, uh, an education app used by millions and millions of students in India that was just leaking all of the data for all of their students. And, it, you know, we wrote a story about, um, there was a security story about, you know, uh, their, their data practices. Uh, another source I usually turn to is DDoS, uh, distributed, distributed Denial of Secrets. They're a transparency organization that publishes leaked and hacked data. Um, I've done a few stories with their data. Uh, some of it, uh, you know, I did one about uh, Metropol the DC Police Department, uh, their disciplinary process, because we had just tremendous access to DC, DC police data through DDoS. 
Um, and the last one is what I've mentioned, which is these custom search engines, which honestly I've used dozens and dozens of times for stories. It, I, find them, I find them incredibly helpful if you just compile a list of websites and uh, upload it to Google and um, you know, to target your searches a little bit, a little bit better. So that's basically all we have, um, which is great because we have a bunch of time for questions. So um, I have questions of my own that I can like ask everyone, but I'm curious, just like as a gut check, how many people here have a question they wanna ask? Stuff, you can raise your hands if you have one. All right, cool. So um, there's a lady in pink with the microphone who's gonna bring it over. Um, uh, this is a question for Leon. I'm curious about the story that you presented about the uh, digital divide. Um, what, why would a company do something like that? What did you find by when, when you sort of learned all of this? What was your conclusion? And did the research end up changing anything once it was revealed? Yeah, um, so internet's not a utility, which means it's not regulated in the United States. And places that you know, ISPs had opted into um, installing fast fiber infrastructure um, was done for various reasons, but it wasn't everywhere, um, probably due to cost. And for that reason, whatever reason, they chose to keep the price the same. Uh, and they chose, I think there are also laws where um, because extremely slow legacy internet is in place, you can't rip it out either. And so both um, unequal development and the inability to deprecate poor services um, there's this great inequity that grows, right? Aaron, if I missed anything, you should voice it. But, oh, I got thumbs up. Okay, <laughs> there's my colleague Aaron, in the, in, if you want to ask him too, um, in case I got anything wrong. But that's the gist of it. Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> did anything change? Um, so the FCC has this uh, Digital Discrimination Act uh, in play that uh, may or may not get passed. But after our investigation, they opened up a public uh, comment on our study. And uh, a bunch of, uh, I will say that a lot of organizations working on net inclusion, like getting access to internet to people around the country had all read the report and they're using it to demand accountability. And what we're doing next is we're making, we're trying to lower the bar so that anyone in the United States can reproduce the study. Um, we're making it easy to sample addresses, pull census information, and hand collect that data so that they too can demand accountability and you know, build their own data sets and see these patterns because they're so stark, so easy to find. Um, so we're trying to help empower people to, to call for more action and the FCC does seem to be looking at it, but it's difficult given the current situation that they don't have a majority of the seats. <laughs> Uh, thanks all three of you, really, really amazing stuff and um, great to see these techniques being put to such good use. Um, I wanted to ask um, a sort of general question about the, um, uh, I was quite struck by the point that Leon made about this historic redlining data having been geo-referenced and used for sort of context for current analysis that you're now doing. Um, I was kind of struck by that because it's sort of the opposite of how I would tend to use geo-referencing. I'm, I'm often sort of taking something that I know currently exists but isn't mapped and geo-referencing that or, you know, off an existing sort of paper map or whatever that someone's put together and then comparing that to a sort of um, underlying digital map that I do have. Um, I wondered if you could um, reflect or, you know, any of the three of you on, are there other examples of this sort of um, process of, uh, old, you know, old cartography providing context for cutting edge um, analysis. I just thought it was a really, really interesting sort of juxtaposition. Um, no worries if not, bit of a put you on the spot question there. I can't think of any off the top of my head. I mean, it's, it's all a matter of digitization, right? Thanks to University of Richmond, they did the paint um, can you imagine turning a map into 
GeoJSON, like, does anyone even know what GeoJSON is? Like, probably not. Um, but, it, you know, if you work with data, you, you might. But uh, it's a painstaking process, right? There are, like, coordinates for each and every, like, shape, right? And so it's a painstaking process that they did, and I'm glad that they did, because um, in certain instances here, like, there's a term called digital redlining, right? So I'm not that clever, but I'm like, well, we have digital data, and we have redlining data. <laughs> like, is, can we make... Can we analyze it? So um, I'd, I'd love to see more efforts towards that. It just, it just takes a significant amount of power to actually you know, make it actionable and make it analyzable. Hi. Um, I, I really like how three of you, you know, gave very different, uh, like what to me is like tactical maneuvers to getting the data. Um, but on a bigger picture kind of a level, like, what would you say is like the overarching strategy that you would use when you get a question and then you know right off the data is very tough to get? And so what's the strategy that you always keep in mind in getting those data? Why don't you go first? Yeah, um, thanks for asking that question. It's, it's a really important question. Um, and uh, I, I think you should be no stranger to this because I saw you present and you mentioned you, you start with a hypothesis, right? We're very similar where we have kind of a experimental checklist of questions that we ask, including like, what's the hypothesis? What's the accountability angle? Um, what is the prior art? Like, who's being harmed? What are early indicators? What's your plan to collect data? How difficult is that going to be? How will you analyze that data? Do you have to make categorizations? If so, how do you plan to do that? What are the limitations of all these processes? What are sentences you hope to write? Right, so those are actually pretty much every single question we think about, and it ends up in the writing the methodology essentially, right, by answering all those questions and figuring out what the. Um, but I, I will say too that like the trial analysis is super super important because it'll immediately show you um, how difficult those questions are to answer, right? Like if you focus on a small small segment of a larger question. Um, but yeah, I think that's a constant conversation that we have, like with. Um, Jeremy, my data coach, and uh, my editor uh, and partners, right? And we just fill it out consistently, just revisiting those questions. Yeah, I mean, I think I co-sign on that for sure. I think having a, having a hypothesis and starting with that makes the most sense for me. But I think something that you had mentioned is the you're dr like writing out the dream sentences you would like to you would actually like to write in a final piece and trying to reverse engineer exactly what you need to get you as close as possible to that sentence. Um, that's typically how I go about thinking about where to start sourcing data. No, I think I think you two covered it really well. But but I will say it's like it's no surprise that to answer many of these questions, the the resources don't exist yet, right? No one the synthesized data is not there. You often have to go out and either bring things together, right, that are publicly available but not open, right? There's a really important distinction because open data is documented. There's like usually a data dictionary and notes about how to use it and assumptions, but public data is not, but it's available. And if you just bring it together and then you have to document it yourself to bring meaning and use it for your reporting. Thanks guys. I thought that was really interesting, all the different ways that, uh, that you got there. But th this question for Gabriel. Has the city of Rotterdam done anything to adjust their algorithm since your story? Yeah, they, they stopped using it and they're updating, they're, they're trying to update it, but kind of said something interesting, which I think may mean they're not going to continue using it, which is, um, like they wrote something to the city council saying, it's like, we're try working on this, but it's really hard for us to find a solution that works, is ethical and is legal. Um, which, yeah, I, th I think that's a, them saying they're giving up, probably. Um, but they did say, sorry, one additional thing they did say, I, I think they were actually quite graceful about the results, um, and they said um, that they found them insightful and said that they should be a warning to other cities across Europe that are doing similar things. Anyone else? Oh, someone up front. Um, Leon, you mentioned that you had a data coach. Can you talk to us a bit about that? And I feel like all of us in here want a data coach. <laughs> uh, I was actually having a conversation about Jeremy 
with, uh, not about Jeremy. Well, like about Jeremy with Jeremy. And he says that, you know, I like to think of myself as a data, ther data therapist. And really, he's more like a data psychoanalyst because I think that he has good credentials and he's basing his uh, advice on theory, I believe. So um, it's kind of similar to, um, uh, Jeremy, you, what you do and what you do as a data editor, I feel like are very similar where, you know, I typically will write memos about the, the current problem I'm working on, share it with Jeremy, he'll edit it, and we'll, you know, it's basically about addressing questions and saying, tell me more um, about something very uncomfortable to me, and I'm like, please don't dig into that. But I need someone to do that because uh, it'll make me a better person, it'll make the investigation better, right? Um, asking those hard questions. And you really just need a third party to ask those hard questions because you, you, you can't trust yourself. Um, uh, you need to learn to, li to live with yourself uh, and, and <laughs> to understand the limitations of the data and like really you know, make sure you can answer everything because he's the first line of defense, right? Because it's part of the long process of bulletproofing. In addition to Jeremy, um, after everyone has taken a look, we send it out for external review and they act kind of like an academic sense of reviewer too to be like, you, we don't like this, right? Um, obviously in a better way. Uh, but, and then we send it to the uh, actual investigation targets as well. And so by then we should be fully therapeutized and uh, bulletproof our things. And we're like, we're healthy, we're happy. Um, you don't seem very happy right now and you don't seem very healthy either. Here's the evidence that suggests that, so uh, yeah. All right, well, thanks so much for coming everyone. Um, oh, actually, you know what? There's a question in the back and I think we have some time for it. Um, thanks, Drew. If you mentioned um, using CSE to search 3,500 police department websites, how do you find the websites of 3,500 police departments? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in this case, what I had done is I automated Google searches for for like every. I think I had you know the the top uh, maybe th I guess 3,500 most populous cities in the United States, and I basically automated a search that was like this city plus police department. And I would take like the top three results from each and I went through it manually actually and you know called the ones that were just local news or something like that and kept the ones that were real. Um, oftentimes for other s uh, search engines that I've built, uh, you can just essentially find a lot of this stuff um, already. Wikipedia has large lists of websites that I use a lot. Um, yeah. No more questions. Uh, great. Well, it's a beautiful day. We should go out or do another panel. Uh, and uh, you can contact us here or talk to us. We're nice, most of us. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about myself. Um, that wasn't a slight. I'm just killing time now. Um, thanks, everybody. <laughs>